Have you ever wondered what it would be like if someone took the abstract concept of straw man argumentation and made it into a fictitious feature film? Well, it's your lucky day because you don't have to wonder! Not only is this concept already a feature film, but it's a trilogy! It's called God's Not Dead! Tyler and I watched all three of the God's Not Dead movies. Why do you follow me? Unfollow me. 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 Most people won't work this hard. Most people won't get this hard. Throughout the series, we referred to them as God No Dun Dun. I think based on that meme with the fast food where it says America Run No Dun Dun. I'm pretty sure we were intoxicated for these movies. How could you not be? So from here on out, I'm going to be calling them God No Dun Dun, the movie. <laughs> but in watching the God's Not Dead movies, not only did I have a fantastic Friday Night B-movie experience, I also noticed something very interesting about one of the main characters. This main character was a man by the name of Pastor Dave. And not only was he one of the main characters of the movie, but the actor who played him, David A.R. White, was a producer and founder of the company Pure Flix, which is the Christian version of Netflix, and had also starred in a shitty B-movie from the 90s that I'd watched drunk back in college called Second Glance. Hey, Scotty. Jesus, man. A lot of things were starting to come together for me, but I don't want to focus on any of that right now. What I want to focus on is the fact that this character was named Pastor Dave, and he was played by a man who was also named Dave. Guess what, guys? It's time for another Deep Dave! 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 From the standpoint of ooh, ooh, ooh. You will not go unpunished. You guys asked for it. What's up, my fellow small business supporters? I'm Savvy. Welcome back to Savvy Writes Books. This is the channel where we talk about books and business. Today, we're not going to be really talking about books, but more of the storytelling angle of some movies, as well as a deep dive into a director, actor, and producer and his methods of storytelling, so we can kind of still talk about the writing aspect of things, but we're mostly focusing on the Dave today. Welcome back to our series, Deep Daves, which is the series where we dive deep into the lives of various guys named Dave, and sometimes we dive deep into the buttholes of buttholes named Dave. Now this particular Dave, I don't think it's really a butthole, he's just kind of cringe. And in watching the God's Not Dead movies, I honestly found Pastor Dave to be one of the most likable characters, but then I remembered that obviously David A.R. White would give himself the most likable role in the movie because... That's what Daves do! So if you like that kind of thing, videos about business and anti-multi-level marketing stuff, book reviews of mostly business books, and also videos about guys named Dave, if you like those things, you'll want to subscribe to this channel. Now some people might say, okay, Savvy, but talking about a subject as serious as religion on your channel is a little bit risky. People always tell you, don't talk about sex, politics, and religion. I mean, I talk about all three of those things on my channel anyway. But anyway, my point is, God's not dead, meaning the YouTube gods that demonetize my videos are also not dead. So just in case the YouTube gods think that this video is offensive to their godly sensibilities, it's great that today's video has a sponsor. Today's video is sponsored by Magic Spoon, a high protein, low carb brand of fun breakfast cereals with a variety of tasty flavors. Magic Spoon cereals have been with me throughout my entire process of getting back into working out during my surgery recovery. I'm now back at the gym with my trainer once a week, plus working out at home again, and it's been super important to me to get extra protein into my meals every day. So starting the day off with a high protein breakfast feels amazing and gets me on the right track every day. Magic Spoon cereals have zero grams of sugar, 13 to 14 grams of protein, and only four net grams of carbs per serving. They also have about 140 calories per serving and are keto-friendly, gluten-free, grain-free, soy-free, and low-carb. You can build your very own variety box and choose from Magic Spoon's best-selling cocoa, fruity, frosted, peanut butter, cookies and cream, maple waffle, blueberry, and cinnamon, plus the newly reformulated honey nut flavor that will now be added to the Magic Spoon permanent collection. Lately, I've been loving eating the fruity flavor, and since Magic Spoon recently sent me a box of the new honey nut flavor, I'm really starting to enjoy that one as well. It's delicious, guys. So click the link below to get some Magic Spoon 
cereal. You can build your very own variety box and use my code SAVVY for $5 off. And since Magic Spoon is now adding Honey Nut to their permanent collection, make sure to add that to your custom box and try it out as well. Magic Spoon is so confident in their product that it's backed with a 100% happiness guarantee. So if you don't like it for any reason at all, they'll refund you your money, no questions asked. And also for my Canadian and British viewers, don't forget, Magic Spoon is also now shipping to Canada and to the UK. So click the link below and use the code SAVVY for $5 off or go to magicspoon.com SAVVY to save $5 on your order today. Thank you again to Magic Spoon for sponsoring this video. Additionally, I would like to give a quick thank you to all of my Patreon supporters. You guys are fantastic. Guys, check out the description below where all Patreon supporters who contribute $5 a month and up have their own small businesses, social media pages, their own channels, things like that linked in the description below. Now, let's dive into a new Dave. I first discovered David A.R. White, I wanna say my senior year of college. So as you guys know, I've talked about this on my channel before. One of my few hobbies that I have never tried to monetize, but I guess now that I'm doing this video review, that ship has sailed too. But one of my main hobbies is watching bad B-movies, specifically from the 80s and 90s, getting wildly drunk while doing this, and that's how Tyler and I spend almost every date night, and that's how we spend most of our parties. We'll invite a group of friends over, we'll all watch some shitty B-movies and get drunk, make wild commentary during the movies. That has been my hobby for quite some time at this point. When I was in college, I was introduced to this concept of shitty Christian movies. Now at this time I was already a big fan of movies like The Room, things like that. I was also really into like bad after school special type movies. I was really into the movie Cyberbully on ABC Family after watching Your Movie Sucks do a review of it, which I found hilarious at the time. I was a fucking edgelord in college, as you guys know. Some of it stayed with me, some of it's gone. So the first movie I watched was one I found for free on YouTube from the early 90s called Second Glance. So this was back when David A.R. White himself was like a teenager. As a child, he often starred in like side roles on various like cable shows and soap opera shows and things like that. But his first like leading role was in the movie Second Glance, which is now available to watch for free on YouTube with the famous line at the end. Hey Scotty, Jesus man. Just go up to everyone you know and say, Jesus, man. But basically, this movie was a ripoff of the movie It's a Wonderful Life, which a lot of movies and TV shows do ripoffs of now. This movie, which was David A.R. White's first starring role, was a movie where he comes from a nice suburban Christian family, and one day, everything at school is going wrong for him. His sister's pranking him, the girl that he likes rejects him for, like, the cool jo guy instead. Uh, all these kind of things are just crumbling around him, and to make matters worse, he's decided that he wants to show a Christian film after school, and nobody wants to come to it because being Christian is lame. All of these terrible things cause young Dave to question if he ever should have been a Christian in the first place, and much like George Bailey in It's a Wonderful Life wishes he was never born, young Dave wishes that he had never become a Christian. Become a Christian is a little bit of a weird thing to say considering he's still a child in this movie. He's in high school, but okay. So he decides he wishes he'd never become a Christian. This wish gets granted for him, and then the next day he wakes up to see how his life had changed. His life has changed in a variety of ways, none of which the movie ever directly connects to him being Christian. For example, his father has moved out of the house, his younger sister's never been born, his mom is divorced and dating some new guy with a nice car, like, and it's never explained how Dave being Christian had anything to do with any of these things, but it's just assumed that, like, you being Christian is what kept your family together. How do we know this? We just know it, I guess. Anyway, at the end of the movie, Dave realizes that being Christian was the best thing all along, and he tells his friend Scotty, Jesus, man. And that's how the movie ends. It's, I think, under 45 minutes long. But that movie had me fascinated with this guy, David A.R. White. Now, this movie was not directed by David A.R. White, as I'm sure you guys could guess, considering in this movie he was a teenager playing a teenager. He was still a child actor at this point. This movie was directed by Rich Cristiano, who is named that because he is rich and he is Christian. 
No, that's not actually why. That's just his name, I guess, for normal name reasons. In the 80s and 90s, Rich Cristiano was a director of lots of shitty, low-budget Christian movies, and that helped David A.R. White find his launch to fame. In 2005, when David A.R. White was in his 30s, he decided to found a company called Pure Flix, which is the Christian equivalent to Netflix. Now, I just want to make a quick disclaimer. If you are watching this and you are a Christian, I have nothing but respect for everybody's individual beliefs as long as they're respectful of other people. I don't have any particular religious beliefs myself. I guess you could call me an agnostic. At one point on Your Morning Guru, we did a week on atheism and we read The God Delusion by Richard Dawkins and he was like, I'm an agnostic about the God the same way that I'm an agnostic about fairies as if to say that like, obviously fairies don't exist. And I'm like, well, maybe they do. I don't know. Like, I'm just like comfortable with the fact that I don't know fucking anything. I'm just an idiot. I'm just a meat sack floating through space. But I was originally born and raised Polish Catholic in Chicago, but that didn't continue throughout my entire childhood. So I didn't have a massive religious influence on me. But my whole point is I am respectful of everyone's beliefs as long as they're respectful of other people in their own personal lives. So this is not me saying that like Christian things are bad. This is me saying that on the whole, when you make a piece of entertainment with the express purpose of having one particular message, it can turn out well, but it doesn't usually. So here's an example. Christian media that has turned out very well. Veggie Tales. Christian media that has turned out awful. Everything else. And honestly, I'm, I'm not trying to just say this as a religious thing, and this isn't particularly like a right-wing thing either. This is really any media that exists for the sole purpose of pushing a message. And I don't want to confuse this with the idea of, I know in the past I've made fun of Jordan Peterson because he's like, any art with a political message is now propaganda and it's not art. That's not what I'm saying. I think art can have a message and often does and is often motivated by the desire to share a belief or a message or something core to who you are with the world, and that's very important. What I'm saying is when you sacrifice plot and you sacrifice a suspension of disbelief and you spe and you sacrifice every other element of what's going to make it good in favor of only focusing on that message, then it often turns out bad. Here's another example. You know something that's really important and that we all should care about? The environment. You know a movie that does a great job with an environmental message even though that's a huge part of what it's trying to push? Wally. -E. That movie's adorable. You know what movie doesn't do a great job with its environmental message? Birdemic. So my whole point is sometimes when you focus too much on the message, it can be an issue. And that's all to say that Pure Flix is not the pinnacle of entertainment, which is funny because the name of the overall company that owns Pure Flix, that David A.R. White founded as the overall entertainment company is called Pinnacle Peak, which is kind of funny. But according to Wikipedia, PureFlix was actually acquired by Sony in 2020. I'm not sure how that happened. Sony, what the fuck are you doing buying PureFlix? Now, I'm not gonna go into reviewing all of the shows on the PureFlix streaming service, which is the clean Christian alternative to Netflix, because we'll be here all day if we go into all those. If you guys are interested, I may watch some PureFlix shows and review them if that's something that you guys find interesting. Let's instead get into David A.R. White's role as Pastor Dave in the God's Not Dead series. Now, now, I've been meaning to watch the God's Not Dead movies for years. As I mentioned, David A.R. White had come onto my radar years ago as somewhat of an important figure in the shitty movie arena. Yet, I hadn't watched his magnum opus yet, the God's Not Dead series. How had that happened? Well, simply, I forgot. I forgot until one night on our usual Friday night date night of watching shitty movies, Tyler and I decided to watch this 90s made-for-TV movie called Future Sport, which starred Dean Kane. At the time, I was like, okay, this guy Dean Kane, he kind of looks familiar. What might I know him from? So we went and searched for him on IMDb and we found out he was in God's Not Dead. And that, then it hit me. That's a movie I've been meaning to watch forever. So guys, the following Friday for date night, when we didn't know what movie we were going to watch, it was all about God No Dun Dun. Guys, I paid for the rental of this movie. I rented all three movies and we got drunk as shit and we watched the God's Not Dead movies. First God's Not Dead movie. The first God's Not Dead movie centers on a protagonist who is a college freshman. His name is not Joss Whedon, but it is, I believe, 
Josh Wheaton. Josh Wheaton? I don't know why David A.R. White chose a name so similar to Joss Whedon if this kid wasn't meant to be a Joss Whedon illusion in any way, but I don't believe he was. It, it almost like the fact that this kid's name was Josh Wheaton made it sound like he was supposed to like be parodying Joss Whedon in some way, but there were absolutely no allegories or ties to that. I think it was an accident, honestly, which was just very weird. So this kid's name is Josh Wheaton. And Josh comes to college for the first time. Josh is a devout Christian and he is worried that his faith is going to be shaken in college as people around him try to question things. Now, from a narrative standpoint, when you're writing a piece of fiction, again, just to be clear, you know, when I give writing advice, these are not hard and fast rules. All writing is subjective based on what you like. But what most audiences tend to find satisfying in any piece of fiction is to have a protagonist who kind of goes through a character arc. Someone who starts off with their own strengths and weaknesses, who uses their strengths to solve a problem, and then uses their established weaknesses, insecurities, and difficulties. They have to eventually overcome those and learn something new or discover that they're wrong about something or transform into a better person along that journey tied in with using their strengths. That tends to be something that most of us find satisfying. The problem with the God's Not Dead movies is that the Christian character at the beginning is always definitively right. While they may have to question things here and there a little bit, the questioning period is never that serious and and you know that they're never going to have to actually learn anything new about themselves other than learning they were right all along. The God's Not Dead series are very black and white in terms of who's good, who's bad, and it's always directly tied to who's Christian. So the God's Not Dead series after Josh Wheaton, who goes to his first Philosophy 101 class. And his philosophy professor is played by Kevin Sorbo. Kevin Sorbo, philosophy professor, whatever his name is, is a hardcore atheist. And on the first day in class, he sits down Josh and all the other students in the lecture and in order for them to pass the class, they all have to write God is dead on a piece of loose leaf and turn it into him. All my atheist friends in the chat, have you ever made other people write God is dead on a piece of loose leaf in order for you to accept them? Let me know in the comments below because I actually have quite a lot of atheist friends. I have atheist friends, okay? I love atheists. I have atheist friends. I have a lot of atheist friends and I've never heard of any of them even say the phrase God is dead. So I don't even know where he came up with that from. And this is really where the straw man part of the movie starts to feel like it's coming in. The professor forces the students to write God is dead on a piece of paper. And if I were in Josh's situation in this case, and if I were a student in this class where my philosophy professor is making me adhere to his particular religious beliefs or lack thereof, what I would do as a student, if I were a Christian, would be to probably go into, you know, one of the student resource offices and say, hey, you know, does this school have any protection for, against religious discrimination? Because my professor is telling me that I have to, you know, express religious beliefs that are against my own or that I have to go against my own religious beliefs in order to pass his class. He has says that I personally have to hold that opinion. It'd be one thing if the professor was saying, well, everyone has to engage with types of philosophy outside of Christian philosophy. Like that would make perfect sense. But for every student to have to on the first day of class say God is dead and they have to declare that in order to pass the class, that seems a little ridiculous. I think that most schools have some kind of protection clause against that, especially if it's a public university. So that would be my first step if I were in Josh's shoes would be to say, hey, can you let me know if there are any resources? I'm not comfortable with this. Because to say God is dead, that's not only going to offend Christian students, that's also going to like, imagine there's like a Jewish student or a Muslim student in that class. We'll get into how, uh, how David A.R. White feels about religions that are not Christianity in just a second. But my point is there are lots of students other than just Christians who may be made to feel uncomfortable by that. And this is completely outside the point that once again, this is a complete atheist straw man. I have had many atheist professors in my day. I have have had known many atheist people and I have never once seen them force religious people that they have direct power over to give up those beliefs in order to get ahead in life. That's absolutely manipulative and awful. And so this movie just kind of makes up what atheists are doing because if it talked about what atheists are actually doing, which for the most part is just kind of living their life, sometimes being edgy on Reddit, but other than that, like not really doing anything, <laughs> then there would be no interesting movie to be had. You have to make the Christians seem like the persecuted victim 
class in this case. So no, Josh does not go to the student resource center. Josh does not say, hey, this professor's doing this and get that shut down real quick. Nor does Josh find other students in the class who are religions other than Christian or any other religion for that matter and team up with them. Instead, what Josh does is he is the one Christian brave enough in class to take a stand and tell the professor, you know what? I don't think God is dead. I think God's not dead. God no done done professor. And the professor says, okay, well then let's plan for a live debate in front of the entire class over the existence of God. Who, why, when, who would ever do that? So anyway, this professor says they're gonna do that. And that's when I realized that this movie was literally based on a fucking Reddit post. Do you guys remember that Reddit post that went viral a few years back where it was like, or maybe it was even like 4chan or some shit. It's like, be me, a Christian student sitting in class, atheist professors at the front of the classroom, like God not real. And I'm like, how can you hate God if he doesn't exist? Checkmate atheist. And then the eagle swooped in. Like that was a whole meme for a while, remember? Remember that? This was a fucking copy pasta. This movie is based on a copy pasta that was meant to be a meme. It's literally taking that as the plot. And that's when I was like, oh my god. Why do you follow me? If you don't already own my book, it will change your life. Why do you follow me? If you don't already own my book, it will change your life. Why do you follow me? If you don't already own my book, it will change your life. Why do you follow me? If you don't already own my book, it will change your life. Why do you follow me? If you don't already own my book, it will change your life. Why do you follow me? If you don't already own my book, it will change your life. Why do you follow me? If you don't already own my book, it will change your life. Why do you follow me? If you don't already own my book, it will change your life. Why do you follow me? If you don't already own my book, it will change your life. Why do you follow me? If you don't already own my book, it will change your life. Why do you follow me? If you don't already own my book, it will change your life. Why do you follow me? If you don't already own my book, it will change your life. Why do you follow me? If you don't already own my book, it will change your life. Why do you follow me? If you don't already own my book, it will change your life. Why do you follow me? If you don't already own my book, it will change your life. Why do you follow me? If you don't already own my book, it will change your life. Why do you follow me? If you don't already own my book, it will change your life. Why do you follow me? If you don't already own my book, it will change your life. Why do you follow me? If you don't already own my book, it will change your life. Why do you follow me? If you don't already own my book, it will change your life. Why do you follow me? If you don't already own my book, it will change your life. Why do you follow me? If you don't already own my book, it will change your life. Why do you follow me? If you don't already own my book, it will change your life. Why do you follow me? If you don't already own my book, it will change your life. Why do you follow me? If you don't already own my book, it will change your life. Why do you follow me? If you don't already own my book, it will change your life. Why do you follow me? If you don't already own my book, it will change your life. Why do you follow me? If you don't already own my book, it will change your life. Why do you follow me? If you don't already own my book, it will change your life. Why do you follow me? If you don't already own my book, it will change your life. Why do you follow me? If you don't already own my book, it will change your life. Why do you follow me? If you don't already own my book, it will change your life. Why do you follow me? If you don't already own my book, it will change your life. Why do you follow me? If you don't already own my book, it will change your life. Why do you follow me? If you don't already own my book, it will change your life. Why do you follow me? If you don't already own my book, it will change your life. Why do you follow me? If you don't already own my book, it will change your life. Why do you follow me? If you don't already own my book, it will change your life. Why do you follow me? If you don't already own my book, it will change your life. Why do you follow me? If you don't already own my book, it will change your life. Why do you follow me? If you don't already own my book, it will change your life. Why do you follow me? If you don't already own my book, it will change your life. Why do and how she listens to Christian pop on her phone and her dad catches her and gets mad at her about it. It's very weird and it's very disrespectful. It just kind of portrays this idea that Christianity is the best religion and if you're a different religion, your religion's not as good so you should convert to Christianity. It really felt like that. Another plot that was woven in with it was about Pastor Dave himself. So Pastor Dave is the local pastor whose church is right next to the college campus and he's the, the neighborhood pastor. Everyone there loves him. Josh wants to kind of study under him and become a pastor in the church as well. Uh, pastor Dave's plot in this movie has absolutely nothing to do with Josh. I'm not really sure why this movie is so dis disjointed, but Pastor Dave has a friend named Pastor Jude, who is a visiting pastor from abroad. The two of them are best friends, and I headcanon them as gay Christian husbands, and we'll talk more about that as we get into the other two movies starring them. But uh, the movies are much more funny and interesting if you imagine that the two of them are in a gay Christian husband relationship the whole time. But anyway, Pastor Dave and Pastor Jude both want to go to Disney World. They've decided that they're going to take a car trip down to Disney World, and then the whole issue of the movie is that they want to get a rental car, and the rental car that they get keeps not working. Like, that's their plot. Their rental car doesn't work. How is that related to anything else in the movie? It's not, is the answer. It's actually not related to anything else in the movie, but that's part of it. And then when their car finally works, they go, God is good! Oh, sorry, no, it is related to something in the movie. The fact that they don't get to go to Disney World because their car doesn't work allows them to be around when the Muslim girl sees them about converting to Christianity. It's really stupid. Anyway, so Josh has decided to debate the atheist professor. Then we get to see this other plot line about this, oh my god, I'm just realizing how many plots are in this fucking movie that like don't even really come together that well. So anyway, Josh has decided he wants to debate the atheist professor. Then we see some of the atheist professor's life. So the atheist professor has a long-term girlfriend. His girlfriend has a mom who's dying of Alzheimer's. The mom who's dying of Alzheimer's has that girl and her son, who is the girl's older brother, who is played by Dean Cain, again, who's the reason I watched this movie because he was in Future Sport. So he's played by Dean Cain and he's like this guy that doesn't care about his family and only cares about money. And then Dean Cain is also dating this journalist and the journalist girl is also an atheist 
and wants to write a hit piece about Duck Dynasty. This is all one movie, you guys. But then the atheist journalist girl finds out that she has cancer. And when she finds out she has cancer, Dean Cain's character dumps her because he's like, oh, you're not going to be fun to fuck now that you have cancer because he's an asshole because atheists are assholes. So then Dean Cain's character uh, talks to his sister and his sister has the mom dying of Alzheimer's and she's dealing with her mom and then the sister's boyfriend comes home and the boyfriend is the atheist professor. I can't keep all these people straight either, don't worry. The boyfriend's the atheist professor. And then you find out, because guys, don't forget, in these movies, all the Christian characters are good and all the atheist characters are bad. And all the characters who are religions other than Christian are kind of in the middle of good and bad and will become fully good once they become Christian. That is the black and white view of this movie. Atheist professor comes home to his girlfriend and you find out he's way older than her because she was his student in class. She was his student her freshman year and he saw her sitting in the front row and loved the way she argued things in class and just fell in love with her. So now we learn that atheist professor is not only bad because he's an atheist, but they had to make him a groomer too. So anyway, the girlfriend is Christian and atheist professor is an atheist. So they regularly have these arguments over their religious beliefs. Now the two of them, you know, I've known many people who have been in different religion type of relationships and generally what they do is respect each other's beliefs, but that's not what these two can do. And the girlfriend is always right. She's always doing things that are correct. Whereas atheist professor, is always being awful and then he has this house party where he invites everyone over and they just make fun of the Christian girl the whole time and treat her like the service which is uh, awful and has nothing to do with religion but the movie pretends like it does so anyway Josh is still preparing to debate the atheist professor then finally the big moment comes where Josh and atheist professor debate one another oh man what's gonna happen they're getting ready for the debate an atheist professor reveals that the reason he stopped believing in God is that when he was a kid, his mom got diagnosed with cancer. She died no matter how much he prayed for her to live, she still died. So he just lost all belief in God. And I'm like, I mean, that's kind of fair. <laughs> Along with this though, Pastor Dave and Pastor Jude are still trying to get their asses to Disney World. And then they get a new car and that car finally runs and it's time to go to Disney World. And they go, God is good. God is good because he got you a car to go to Disney World, but God was too busy the day he had to save Atheist Professor's mom from dying of cancer. Got it. God has his priorities in order, it seems. So, Josh is debating Atheist Professor, and after a while, Josh is like, Why do you hate God so much? And Atheist Professor breaks down and is like, I do hate God. You're right. I hate him because he took my mother from me. And then I was, my drunk ass was on the couch, and I turned to Tyler, like, to make a joke, and I'm like, huh, this is gonna be like the copy pasta. He's just gonna go, How can you hate? him if he doesn't exist. And then literally what I said as a joke came to fruition a moment later. Josh turns to Atheist Professor and just goes, but how can you hate God if he doesn't exist? Oh! <laughs> Checkmate atheists! You hate God yet God doesn't exist! Oh! So that's how the professor guy got owned by this freshman college kid who wants to be a pastor. So anyway, what happens after that is that this journalist girl who was dumped by Dean Cain, who is dying of cancer, uh, I guess God's gonna save her from cancer, even though God didn't save Atheist Professor's mom from cancer. It's very unclear who God wants to save from cancer and who he doesn't. So anyway, this girl, uh, who's struggling with cancer finds out that there's a Christian rock band who's gonna perform that night. So she goes to the Christian rock band concert to cover the show, I guess, as a journalist and to learn more about Christianity. And she tells the band that she has cancer and they're really nice to her and it makes her believe in Christianity. And then around the same time, the atheist professor's girlfriend dumps him because he's such an asshole to her all the time. And he sees a Christian rock band performing in the newspaper that they're going to be there that night. And he says, I bet my girlfriend's going to be at the Christian rock band show. So I'm going to go meet her there. So basically, this is where all the plot lines are converging, right? All the characters are going to meet up at the Christian rock band concert, or so you think. So Josh heads off to the Christian rock band concert. He's having a good time knowing he checkmated the atheist professor. Atheist professor's ex-girlfriend is heading off to the Christian rock band concert feeling good that she dumped her groomer ass boyfriend. Atheist professor is going to try to go win his girlfriend back. So he's running to the, he's running to the, uh, 
The thing, he's running to the Christian rock band concert. Guess who's also on his way to the concert? Pastor Dave. Pastor Dave's also still on his way to the concert. So, uh, atheist professor's running. He's running to go find his girl. When all of a sudden a car comes across the intersection and smash, smashes into atheist professor. Atheist professor falls into the sidewalk, into the crosswalk, right as Pastor Dave's approaching. Pastor Dave's like, oh my God, atheist professor, I, I'm going to help save you. Try to believe in God right now. If you believe in God, he can help save you. So it's at this last moment and atheist professor, he just dies. And then the Christian rock band plays a song about how God's not dead. And then the movie says, text everyone in your life to let them know that God's not dead. So my drunk ass got my phone out and I texted all my friends to tell them God's not dead. That was the end of the first God's Not Dead. God's Not Dead 2, I think was even worse. God's Not Dead 2 was the story of how Melissa Joan Hart's career went down into the gutter. Melissa Joan Hart, if you guys remember the 90s, was famous first for Clarissa Explains It All on Nickelodeon. That's where I loved her from. And then of course, her biggest role as Sabrina the Teenage Witch. However, like many child and teenage stars do, often after they've reached that peak of child and teenage stardom. They then go on to star in TV and Hallmark style movies until the end of time. And that is very unfortunately what happened to Melissa Joan Hart as she is the star of God's Not Dead 2. God's Not Dead 2 takes place in the same rough arena. Now this movie summary is not going to be nearly as long so don't worry. But basically in the same town where Pastor Dave is the pastor and the college that Josh goes to exists, there's also a high school in that town. And at the high school this teacher is, you know, she's super Christian. She's always, you know, talking about Christian stuff. All her coworkers get annoyed with her for it. And it's public school. So in public school, guys, you're not allowed to teach, you're not allowed to like preach your specific religion to the students. You're allowed to teach about religious history in public school. Like I learned about the histories of where different religions came from and the probable times of different religious figures. And we learned about, you know, ancient Greece, ancient Rome. We learned about the gods and goddesses of that. We learned about the mythology. We learned about a rough time when Jesus would have existed or when Muhammad would have existed and things like that. So we, we all learned those things in school, but in public school, you're not allowed to teach that your religion is the one true one or something like that. And that's because in the US we have separation of church and state. So in a government funded school, you can't do that. That's kind of the plot of this movie is uh, that separation of church and state was actually a bad thing, guys, actually. So this teacher's in class. And this is much like in the first movie where I was like, why didn't Josh just go to the student resource center and say, hey, this teacher's discriminating based on religion and get that sorted out? Like every movie seems like it could have just been fixed with some paperwork, but instead you got to get this big media frenzy going because this is the God's Not Dead series. This is God No Dun Dun. So anyway, Melissa Joan Hart is teaching in the class. When one of the students raises their hand, uh, I believe she's teaching about Martin Luther King. The student raises their hand and is like, Martin Luther King did a lot to help other people. Is, could he be compared to someone like Jesus? Melissa Joan Hart just goes off on this Jesus tangent about Jesus citing all these Bible verses and it's like, girl, come on, you know you can't do that. Like, she could have, first of all, she could have very easily avoided this problem by saying something like, well, actually, Martin Luther King was a reverend, so he was very involved in the church, so he himself did follow the teachings of Jesus, and if you are someone who follows a Christian faith, then those type of teachings may very well be in line with that kind of thing and then just say, yeah, that's a way to draw a connection and move on. She didn't do that. She quoted every Bible verse that she could think of in the moment and decided that today was the day for her Christian manifesto in class. After that, the school board got mad. They got mad at her and she gets roped into this, uh, this whole lawsuit and they hire her a lawyer. So she's got a lawyer and the lawyer negotiates with everybody and the lawyer's like, okay, so the school board has negotiated this. All you gotta do is apologize. And I'm like, wow, that's really easy. But no, cause this is God no dun dun. You can't just apologize. You can never apologize for loving Jesus too much. So instead uh, she says, no, I'm actually gonna girl stop apologizing and I'm not gonna say shit. I refuse. And the lawyer's like, well, bitch, you're kind of making my life difficult right now. So they go into this entire big trial and guess who ends up on the jury? Pastor Dave! <laughs> so then the whole movie is just basically a trial about uh, if what she did in the classroom was unconstitutional or not. It was uh, pretty dumb and all the witnesses they bring in once again because these movies are just 
straw man arguments dramatized was just like nothing that would ever actually happen in real life. Someone in one of my comments on one of my videos said that someone should take the, the Don't Say Gay bill in Florida and make a movie called Don't Say Gay that's like God's Not Dead, but make it like this trial where it's, it's just various scenarios of people saying gay in Florida classrooms and getting put on ridiculous trials like this. I mean, I have been wanting to get back into filmmaking lately. Now I'm marinating on some things. Anyway, instead of her trying to prove for her case that all she was doing was drawing a comparison to a historical figure or whatever, she decides that the more effective way to win this trial would be to prove that God's not dead and to prove that Jesus really did all the stuff that God, that the Bible says he did. I mean, girl, you do you, I guess. <laughs> so she decides to prove that and somehow it's successful and somehow she wins the trial. The teacher is successful in the end, but Melissa Joan Hart's career is deeper in the gutter than ever before. So whether or not that's a happy ending is all a matter of perspective. That's Not Dead 3, I think is where the movie first started to get a little more budget because they were catching on. Now I have recently learned that there is a God's Not Dead 4, but God's Not Dead is a trilogy in my mind. But there is a fourth one that I haven't seen yet, but I will watch and get back to you guys on maybe after I watch some pure flick stuff. But God's Not Dead 3 is, I will say, much higher production value than the other two movies and also features a lot more of Pastor Dave. Now this movie starts off very sad. So, so what's happening in this movie is there's a guy and his girlfriend that go to the college. This is a couple years in the future. Josh has now graduated from college and is working as like Pastor Dave's apprentice or whatever. And he's also studying at law school to become a lawyer to defend Christians in court or something. So Pastor Dave and Pastor Jude are just, you know, having a good old time at church. Meanwhile, at the college, there's this kid whose name I forget and a girlfriend whose name I forget. Uh, the girlfriend is very Christian and this kid is thinking he doesn't want to be Christian anymore. He's thinking of becoming an atheist and this girl's like, no, you have to stay Christian, but he doesn't want to. And so she dumps him and he's so mad about getting dumped that he takes a brick off the ground and throws it through the church. Nobody sees him do it because it's the middle of the night. He throws it through the church and what happens? It hits like a, a pipe, causes a gas explosion. Like you never expect, he expected maybe to break a window. Like this kid had no idea this would happen. Right as Pastor Jude's down there, it explodes, Pastor Jude explodes, Pastor Jude is dead. I did not expect the movie to start that way. Here I thought we had Pastor Jude for the long haul. That's Pastor Dave's gay Christian husband. I was here for Pastor Jude. But turns out, nope, Pastor Jude's just gonna get dead as an emotional expense because these movies are manipulative as shit. So I, my my stupid drunk ass had actually got it invested in Pastor Dave and Pastor Jude's relationship and now I'm over here upset about this. So Pastor Dave is mad and he's trying to figure out what to do to repair the church. Meanwhile, the college is like, well, the, co the church shouldn't really be on college property because this is a public university. This is a public university, yet you don't give a fuck when atheist professor decides to force his beliefs on students, yet also atheist professor's dead. These movies, Pastor Dave is like, no, I'm gonna fight to keep my church and get it repaired, so he needs to go get a lawyer. So his lawyer is, as it turns out, his brother in Chicago. We didn't know about the other two movies, but it turns out he had an older brother the whole time. And I will say, the relationship between Pastor Pastor Dave and his brother is actually quite funny and they actually like in this movie like I gotta give it to them they did a good job creating the sibling relationship and showing like the two of them fighting sometimes having a little bit of goofy antagonism like I kind of liked it you they were endearing me on to Pastor Dave in this movie and some other dumb shit happens and uh I was drunk those are the God's Not Dead movies I think again the biggest narrative flaw with all of these movies though is there isn't a lot of learning and growth that happens for the person protagonist. In the first movie, the protagonist, who was not Joss Whedon, but Josh Wheaton, never learned that he was wrong about anything because the whole point of the movie was that he wasn't wrong. He just had to stay stronger in his convictions. Instead, it was positioned as this very black and white, atheist professor is an evil guy in every possible way, Christian kid is very good in every possible way and also right about everything. So he wasn't interesting to watch grow at all because he didn't grow. He was stagnant and he didn't need to learn anything. 
The second movie was very similar, with Melissa Joan Hart being the teacher. She didn't learn anything. She didn't learn that, you know, maybe sometimes I do need to apologize. Maybe I do take things a little too far sometimes. There was no character flaw that she had to be introspective on and learn about how to grow more as a person. Instead, it was all about she was right from the beginning because she had her faith in Jesus. Outside of any religious elements, it just makes for very uninteresting and flat characters that are not fun to follow because they don't have any real arc or any real growth over the course of the story. In the third movie, we did get surprisingly a little bit more character exploration with Pastor Dave. Once again, the movie had a bigger budget overall. There were times throughout the movie where with Dave reconnecting with his older brother, his older brother talks a lot about how like he questioned his faith a lot growing up and Dave and his the rest of the, like and Dave and their parents weren't as accepting of that because they were so extreme in their Christian beliefs and so the older brother felt that he wasn't really welcome in the family because of the way he questioned his beliefs and there were a lot of times that Dave kind of pushed back on that but you got to see Dave having to you know be more flexible and how hardcore he pushed his beliefs at all times for the sake of maintaining that positive relationship with his brother and I actually thought that that was good I wish we got to see some of that in the other two movies seeing someone having to say like, yes, my beliefs are important to me, but maybe I don't have to be on about them 100% of the time. Maybe I don't have to be pushing them on everyone else because the relationships in my life are important too. That was actually really nice to see. However, it wasn't followed through fully and you did still get a lot of Dave being the, the hardcore pastor Dave that he is, which I mean, being a pastor is his job. There's nothing wrong with that, but the, you, you didn't get as much growth from him as you would expect. But those were the God's Not Dead movies and that is the trajectory of film maker David A.R. White, founder of the company Pure Flix and overall long-term Christian actor. What did you guys think of today's Deep Dave? Let me know in the comments below and please let me know if you want me to review any other Pure Flix content. I will see you guys again in a couple days for another video, but in the meantime, please keep on supporting small businesses and uh, don't forget, God no done done. Bye! Dave! 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 From the standpoint of, ooh, 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 you will not go unpunished. You guys asked for it.